Nabokov's multi-layered interrogation of the pedophile secret underworld extended to the movies. Anticipating queries raised by more recent critics such as Marion Sinclair, the author detected unsavory currents beneath Hollywood's glittering surface. With Lolita, he took special delight in mocking suspect scenes found in Shelley Temple films. The iconic child star, Shelley Temple, was born on April 23, 1928. For four years during the Great Depression, this talented little girl remained America's number one box office attraction. Shirley began her long film career at age three when she starred in an all-child cast Baby Burlesque series produced and directed by Jack Hayes and Charles Lamont. Lamont is widely credited with being Shirley's discoverer. During the 1930s, the Baby Burlesque short film screened regularly before the main feature. Commonly interpreted as innocent, fun-filled spoofs on leading actresses of the stage and cinema, the Baby Burlesque films are in fact replete with disturbing slapstick jokes and sly innuendos. As the leading lady, Shelley Temple frequently played a prostitute or nightclub performer. In Glad Rags to Riches, she was La Belle Diperina, a dancer at the Lullaby Lobster Palace. Her beau, Elmer, fails to impress when he chomps down hard on an enormous pickle. In War Babies, Pip Squeak Shirley played the diaper-clad harlot Gloria. The toddler soldiers hanging around Pete's Buttermilk Cafe compete for her attention by presenting her with enormous lollipops. Titillating side entertainment is provided by the tap-dancing African-American boy who performs a slow strip tease down to his underwear. Down on all fours, another toddler sits open-mouthed beneath an overturned baby bottle. A large sign in the background states, Sour Milk. When things go awry, Gloria comes to the rescue by pulling a rubber glove from her purse and attaching it to a keg of sweet milk. As the youngster suckles away, a man can be heard moaning rather than mooing on the accompanying soundtrack. Shirley's prostitute status is ultimately confirmed when a patron triumphantly picks his teeth with a bobby pin that held up her diaper. Shirley again played a call girl in politics in Washington. Hired by the nipple and anti-caster oil lobby, she sets out to corrupt a new bumpkin senator. When Senator Claude Buster succumbs to her wily charms, Polly confirms her sex for higher status by stating, Claude Buster's fall from grace sees him go down on a giant cake, bizarrely spewing white icing behind him like a lawnmower. In the last baby burlesque film, Kid in Africa, Shirley played the cannibal civilizing Christian missionary Madame Cradlebait. Attired in hot pants and a white safari hat, the pistol-wielding Madame journeys through the jungle accompanied by an obedient troop of African coolies. During a raid, she is captured and stuck in a cliché cooking pot. After seasoning her with salt, the cannibal chief asked the telephone operator to connect him to extension 342. After Madame Cradlebait is rescued by miniature Tarzan, the action abruptly shifts to an eerie post-honeymoon scene outside the Squaldorf Hotel. An African child carrying a weary nipple cafe specials billboard tanks up at the last chance filling station by sucking on the end of a gas pump. The mouthfuls he swallows are conveniently monitored on the gulp meter standing nearby. In case you missed it, here's a longer close-up of the pump's nozzle. Nabokov directly linked Kid in Africa's subliminal pedophile code to Lolita via a strategy of reiterated themes and numerology. At the Enchanted Hunter's Hotel, Humbert and his nymphette bunked down in room 342. Throughout the night, Humbert's sleep is disturbed by the sound of a flushing toilet, a tainted reminder of the ever-popular honeymoon trip to the Niagara Falls. After Lolita escapes with Quilty, Humbert searches 342 hotels and motels in a vain attempt to track down his elusive nymphette. Nabokov also parodied Charles Lamont's 1934 short film, Managed Money. 
Stelway Shirley sets off with her teenage brother Sonny through a cactus-infested Californian desert. En route, they are bewitched by a luxurious mansion that turns out to be a Fata Morgana, or optical illusion. When they stop to prospect for gold, Shirley backs into a prickly pear. A man suddenly pops out from behind a saguaro and starts laughing. In Lolita's lampooning retake, Humbert dreams of spinning onto California to the Mexican border to mythical bays, saguaro deserts, Fata Morganas. Shirley may have left her career as a child prostitute behind after she was signed up by 20th Century Fox in 1934, but the suspicious scenes did not disappear altogether. Cast as an orphan, motherless child or runaway, the plot lines of Shirley's feature films now revolved around children's institutions and custody battles. Some guardians displayed an odd talent for meeting untimely ends. In bright eyes, Shirley's mother is run over by a speeding vehicle as she crosses the road to catch a bus. Her stern governess meets an equally grisly end in Poor Little Rich Girl. The coincidental car accident theme was ridiculed in Lolita when Charlotte Hayes is run over on the way to posting a letter that would expose Humbert's perverse interest in her daughter. In bright eyes, Shirley dances coquettishly down the aisle under the too appreciative gaze of her aviator pals. Brandishing huge lollipops, the all-male crew proceed to maul Shirley. They pick her up, shove a box of Cracker Jacks under one arm and press her face into an oversized cake that leaves traces of white icing around her mouth. In a mocking reenactment, Humbert complains of catching Little Limp Low dripping a look in the direction of a friendly mechanic and bursting into a perfect love song of wisecracks as soon as he turns his back to buy a lollipop. Shirley often comforts her male co-stars in a too adult fashion. Sometimes she fiddles flirtatiously with their ties. Shades of incest creep into poor little rich girl as Shirley lies cradled in her father's arms, stroking his face and singing. Incest seems a safer option than being stalked by a creepy child predator who tries to lure her with peppermint candy. In Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, Shirley loses her voice and is examined by a doctor behind a locked door without an accompanying adult. The depraved choreography is seen in Captain January, where Shirley has a close encounter with her dancing co-star, Buddy Ebsen. The gratuitous slapstick gags continue. Some of Shirley's studio portraits also present her in a distinctly inappropriate manner. Further signs of a covert pedophilic agenda are discernible in Curly Top, where millionaire benefactor Edward Morgan is utterly bewitched by his orphan ward. Crooning is also new to me. He eagerly anticipates the new thrills on offer in my wonderland. Morgan dreams of an utterly naked, cherubic Shirley gilded in gold paint. Although this scene was either cut or censored, in her autobiography, Shirley recalled fearing death by toxic asphyxiation as she plunged a mythical dart into Morgan's heart. Morgan's hallucinations continue as all the paintings in his study are suddenly haunted by Shirley's image. In Lolita, the piano scene is comically revisited when Quilty stops to sing a few hysterical sonorities accompanied by soundtrack snorts as Humbert chases him around Pavel Mansion. Why, we may ask, is Shirley's dress shorter at the back than the front as she pirouettes on top of the grand piano? And what exactly was the purpose of the scene where Shirley creeps into Morgan's bedroom then jiggles up and down on his stomach? At least Denmark had the sense to ban Curly Top for unspecified corruption upon its release. Curly Top makes use of the Telltale Spider Code. This theme emerges after Morgan buys a hula dress and ukulele for his tiny ward, and we see Shirley dancing in a grass skirt. A short while later, Shirley is lying on the beach reading a comic strip. The camera zooms in on the cartoon, where a man yells, There's a big spider in your skirt! to a woman in a hula dress. A voyeuristic close-up of Shirley's buttocks ensues as she rocks back and forth on a seahorse 
in a swimsuit that is conveniently too small for her. Nabokov parodied this scene by having Lolita swipe the comics from Humbert before flopping down on her belly to read on the piazza. This time it is Humbert who rocks back and forth, as the girl's smell at once set my manhood astir. Despite her enormous popularity, Shirley Temple did have some critics in the 1930s. American film critic Gilbert Seldes compared Shirley to Mae West, the reigning sex goddess, and recommended her directors face a firing squad at daybreak. Seldes thought Shirley's dimpled cuteness had very little to do with her real power, because at her good moments, something like a growl of satisfaction arises from the men in the audience. Across the Atlantic, British writer Graham Greene similarly argued that Shirley attracted male audiences for all the wrong reasons. In his review of Captain January, Greene queried the director's motivations, asserting the camera was being used in a salacious manner to provoke disreputable enjoyment. In his 1937 review of Wee Willie Winky, published by Night and Day magazine, Greene again went on the attack, insisting... Infancy with her is a disguise, her appeal is more secret and more adult. Her neat and well-developed rump twisted in the tap dance, her eyes had a sidelong searching coquetry. This time, 20th Century Fox retaliated, winning substantial damages from Green for implying it had procured Miss Temple for immoral purposes. Nearly two decades later, Graham Greene was an early reader and fan of Lolita. He must have appreciated the novel's little recognised critique of the Hollywood Shirley Temple industry. In his review, Green praised Lolita as one of the best books published in 1955. His comments sparked a heated debate over morality and censorship that eventually culminated in Lolita hitting number one on the bestsellers list in the UK and America. Shirley Temple's legacy lingers on in her movies, books, dolls, figurines and other collectibles. Questions about the motivations of her Hollywood directors are rarely raised. Nabokov very aptly summed up these anxieties when he had Humbert parade past Lolita in my adult disguise, a great big handsome hunk of movie land manhood. 